Good morning, everybody. This is John Mankowski. I'm the coordinator for the North Pacific LCC here in Olympia, Washington. I have with me Megan Carney, our outreach specialist, and we're, she's helping us run the um, webinar this morning. We also have our guest speaker, uh, Nathan Lejewski, up in Alaska, who is uh, making the presentation today. So I'm just uh, welcoming everybody to the call, and I want to introduce Nathan, and we'll um, get started on this. First of all, like always, please put your phones on mute so we don't have to um, be interrupted by background information. That will be very helpful. And um, we'll have some time at the end of the presentation for questions and conversations. So if, as Nathan's talking, if you have some thoughts or comments, please make a quick note of them so that after Nathan's done, uh, we can have that conversation. So it's, uh, I'm happy to uh, kick off this webinar. The North Pacific LCC funds a variety of projects throughout the coastal temperate rainforest region, which runs from um, south central Alaska, the Kenai Peninsula, all the way down to California. And we um, fund projects and help convene people around climate change and how climate change affects natural and cultural resources. So Nathan's project comes to us within our category of cultural resources because he's been working with the Chugach Mute tribe up in Alaska, a representation group of seven tribes, on a perplexing problem, and that is they have noticed that um, culturally significant berry bushes, both salmonberry and blueberry, are suffering some defoliation. And he's been up there uh, working on this, and we were able to uh, help provide some funding in concert with the Alaska Climate Science Center to do some modeling and to try to understand what's going on up there and what sort of management actions can be taken to ensure that these berry plants are a uh, continuing part of the tribe's future. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Nathan. Nathan has both an undergraduate and graduate degree in forestry from NAU in Arizona. Over 10 years' experience working as a forester. He's a certified forester with the Society of American Foresters. And he came to Alaska in 2009. He's been working with the Chugach Mute Forestry Center since then. And he works on a variety of forestry-related topics, from wildfire fighting to uh, looking at forest inventory. And now he's involved in um, uh, insect defoliation, and he's very closely tied to the tribe's uh, cultural aspects of uh, climate change and um, reliance on subsistence resources. So we're very happy to have helped fund this project, and we're now going to give the controls to Nathan, and Nathan Lejewski will uh, ask you to go ahead and make your presentation. Okay, thank you for the introduction, and um, I know I've got on a speakerphone here so I can hear all kinds of beeps when people call in, so you guys may be able to hear that as well. But I just wanted to make sure everyone can see my screen. Looks great, Nathan. Okay. Well, thanks for the introduction, and I was just looking down the list of some of the people who signed in, and I know some of you are aware of this work and are from Alaska, and some folks I don't recognize at all. So um, I'll start this this talk off, and I've kind of split it into five sort of general sections. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the people who live in the Chugach region, and I'll talk about the, the natural environment of um, our region, and then some of the defoliating berries, or the, the losses to the berries due to defoliators, the village's energy situation, and then finally I'll talk about the modeling that we did and how we tend to apply that in action. So thanks for calling in, everybody. So the first thing I wanted to do was show you um, just a general map of Alaska, because I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with the area. But um, the area that, we're, that I work in is generally around the Kenai Peninsula. And you can see the little box near Anchorage in the south um, that shows the Kenai Peninsula. So I'm going to show a zoomed in map there next. And here you can see the Cook Inlet and the Kenai Peninsula and Anchorage. And down at the southern tip of the Kenai Peninsula you can see Port Graham. And the village in Nwalek is about two miles away. And both of these villages, they're not that far from Anchorage or from Homer, but there's no roads there. So to get there you have to on a boat or get on a small airplane and fly in. So here's a picture of some of the people who live in Port Bram and Ninwalek. These are people from all over the Chugach region and they gathered in Port Bram a few summers ago 
to do a language and culture camp. So what this project was, it brought together some of the tribal youth as well as some of the elders and the folks who speak the language and try to do some culture and language education to the youth. There's a, there's a concern that a lot of the, uh, the younger folks and, and even the, I guess the middle age or the adults in the community don't speak the local language anymore and a lot of the culture has been lost and um, Chugachmute has been working on a project of trying to get that language and that culture transferred on to the younger generation before our elders pass away and, and leave. So here's a couple picture of two elders, and both of these folks are really knowledgeable about um, plants and the environment. And you know they have no formal Western training. I don't know if they've gone to high school or if they've. Um, I know they definitely haven't been to university, but these folks know a whole lot about the plants and the environment. Um, the gentleman on the left there, you know, he, he told me you could drop him off in the woods and come back a year later, and he'd still be there. So he can survive off off the environment with very little resources. And the lady on the right there, she she's extremely knowledgeable about our uh, the medicinal plants and how to prepare them and how to use them. And so, you know, these folks hold an immense amount of knowledge and um, are, 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 they're just extremely knowledgeable about the environment. And when they tell me something's going on, I, I you know I. I really believe them. They seem, I mean, they know, they just, it's, it's amazing how much about the environment that these folks know. So as far as subsistence resources in our area, it's extremely important for the tribes. Um, and probably the most important resource for our tribal folks is salmon um, and the marine resources. And here's a picture of some of the, uh, the adults or the elders working with uh, the youth in the tribe during the summer, during the, the language camp, and just just wanted to show this picture of the salmon because this really is the, the most important resource for our folks. I mean, traditionally, before uh, Western folks and the Russians and Americans and Europeans came over, you know, this would have provided the majority of the calories for the year would come from salmon. And here, here's a picture of the berries, which is what I'm going to talk about. And in the foreground there, there's a big bowl of salmon berries. And in the background, you can see some blueberry bushes, or at least the tops of blueberry bushes with berries on them. And uh, what they're doing here is they're going to take the salmon berries and make a jelly or a jam with them. But the blueberries, they're going to make into a tea. And what they do is they just dry out the whole plant with the leaves and the berries on it. And then they'll go ahead and brew that once it dries out at some point. And it's, it's pretty good. But what I wanted to mention was that for the folks in our area, in, in the traditional diet, the berries were one of the very few sweet foods that were available. And um, so, so they're extremely important culturally. And they only come for a short period of time in the summer. And the tribe had a bunch of ingenious way of, of preserving some of these berries out into the winter. So they weren't, you know, they could only harvest them in the summer, in you know, June, July, and August, and September but they had a way to preserve them through the rest of the year. But I know, like when I eat dinner, I like to have dessert afterwards, and uh, I think it'd be hard to go without berries or sweet food. And so if you think back to um, the days before colonization of Europeans in this area, um, you know, this, this was the, the only form of sweet food that was available in the diet. So I'll get back to the berries in a little bit, but I wanted to show you, this is a picture from the air of Port Graham, and you can see here's the, the two ways you can get into Port Graham. One of them is by the air on the airstrip, which is right here in the middle of the picture, and the other one is to come in by a boat, and you can see they've got a fish cannery down there sticking out with a little uh, dock on it, so folks can get in by boat or by air to the area. And what I'd like you to look at is the, the foreground of the picture, you can see this dense Sitka spruce forest. And it's, it's the, that forest is very dense and closed in and not a whole lot of light gets down into the forest floor. And in the background, you can see a bunch of uh, old clear cuts that were done maybe uh, 20, 
20 to 15 years ago by the Native Corporation. And those clear cuts, I'll, I'll show you some pictures from those on the ground, but those are the kind, the two habitat types that we have is this dense mature forest and these young regenerating forests in the clear cuts. And um, I'll show you this picture here. Here's a picture of one of the clear cuts and you can see it's pretty open. And for the salmonberry, these clear cuts are great. Th these things will be loaded with salmonberry. You can't hardly walk through them. And that lasts for a period of time until we hit canopy closure on these young regenerating trees, which will eventually shade out everything in the understory and you won't see anything down in there. But for the blueberries, the blueberries in our area, they grow in partial shade or partial sun. So we typically find them on the edges of roads and meadows and on the edges of these clear cuts or in small gaps or openings in the mature spruce forest. And we find some of them out in these clear cuts, but they just don't do well. When you, when you look at the, the branch top, it almost looks like they've been sun scorched. And they kind of hang on. They will produce some berries, but it's not the ideal place for the blueberries. But if we were to look at a stand like this in uh, 10 or 15 years, I've got a picture here. And this stand was logged probably about 20 to 25 years ago. And I don't have a picture looking into the stand, but under, underneath these Sitka spruce, there is nothing. It's just uh, spruce needles and the forest floor with no vegetation. So once those young clear cuts grow up, it's not good habitat for any berries. There's, there's, almost, there's no vegetation underneath these things, and it's, it's great for Sitka spruce, but it's not good for anything else other than things that might feed on Sitka spruce. So here's a picture of what it might look like, or this is a picture of some of the mature Sitka, Sitka spruce stands. And in these stands, we get a lot more light that comes underneath, and there's a, a well-developed vegetation layer in the forest floor. And this one here, you can't see any blueberries, but what you can see is a bunch of devil's club and some ferns. So not all the openings are great for blueberries, but some of them are very good. And when we find blueberries, this is a picture from August, and this is what they can look like. And this one, I think, was taken either on the edge of a road or on the edge of a meadow. And, and that's where we find the blueberries, and that's what they look like when they're doing well and when they have a, a heavy berry yield on them. And so I, I was able to get up in, a, in the winter a, a year or two ago and take a few pictures of areas where we where we find blueberries. And I'm going to use my, my mouse pointer here. I think you can see that. But this, this chunk here that I'm circling is an area of blowdown. And it's not very big, but these are the kind of areas where we expect to find a lot of blueberries. Um, even the center of this opening gets shaded somewhat during, during the daylight in the summer. And the edges definitely get shade. We also typically find blueberries on the edges of these wet meadows um, where, where you can see the white snow. And uh, that, those are the kind of areas where we find them, and they seem to do really well. And here's a picture inside our forest, inside a small opening. And there's some salmonberry in here, and there's also blueberry. And you can't really see the berry plants. It's hard to pick them out from the green here. But I just wanted to show you what the forest looks like on the inside, where we do find good berries. And I'm spending a lot of time on where the berries grow, because what we, we'd like to do is create some more berry habitat or improve berry habitat. Um, what we find is in these dense forests, there are berries almost everywhere underneath the canopy, but they don't produce berries. So what we'd like to do is be able to harvest a few trees and open up some gaps and, uh, in the canopy to bring more light to the forest floor to help those understory plants do better. And that could be the berries, it could be the devil's club, it could be you know, the salmonberry or all the other plants that are in there. So here's a picture of another opening and this, you can actually see some of the defoliation that we, we noticed out in this area, but uh, I'll show this picture again. 
But here's, a, here's another area that's great berry habitat. There's a lot of blueberry plants mixed in here with some devil's club, and you can see there's not as much devil's club shading everything out. But not all openings are great for blueberries. Here's another opening. That's a picture of me. And uh, there's salmon berry that's about as tall as me. And then there's devil's club that's about twice as tall as I am. So we don't know exactly where we might want to open openings. We just know that it's good for berries, but not all the openings respond the same way. And um, you know, if we create a bunch of great devil's club habitat and we are after berries, that's not meeting our goal. It wouldn't be a bad thing, but uh, we would like to enhance the berry resources in the area. So in 2009, the village elders called me up and said, Nathan, we, we noticed there's something unusual that we've never seen. And um, the salmonberry plants are drying up and dying. Or at least the tops are dying back. So I went out to Nanwalek and Fort Graham and, and looked around. This was in the middle of June. I wasn't able to get to the location where the salmonberry plants were drying up and dying, but I was able to find some salmonberry leaves closer to the village that had obvious defoliation on them. Uh, we didn't know what it was, and whatever insect was doing this work was gone by this point in time. So what we did was we came back into Nanwalk and Port Graham in 2010 in June, in the spring the next year, or may have been the end of May, to see what was happening. And um, during the fall that year, we, we kept getting these news articles about swarms of moths everywhere. So we said, well, okay, well, we saw the foliation, and, and now there's swarms of moths. I wonder if the two can be related. And this is just an article. This one's from 2011. This outbreak went from the southern tip of the port of the Kenai Peninsula down in Port Graham and then Wallach all the way up into the uh, Seward and uh, the whole Kenai Peninsula. It affected the Anchorage area and it, I think it kind of stopped somewhere around Wasilla and Palmer to the north. And you know that's a few hundred mile north-south zone. But what we found in Port Graham the next summer was this. Um, this is a picture in the backyard of um, one of the elders. And in the background, you can see a salmonberry plants. And they're all brown and dried up. And that, that's what the elders were describing to me. And they'd never seen this sort of defoliation or dieback of berry plants. And um, we spoke with one of the tribal elders. And, and he was in his 60s or 70s, and he learned all of his traditional knowledge from his grandfather. So he, he confidently said, you know, in the last 100 years from about 1900, this has never happened in this part of Alaska. And then as a result of this defoliation, there were no salmon berries to pick. There were also no blueberries. I don't have as many pictures of the blueberry defoliation. It's not as impressive when you look at it on a picture. But as far as the resource was concerned, there were no berries to pick for uh, three three or four years in the Port Graham and Wallach area. So a, a loss of such a culturally important resource over this long of a time would most definitely have brought about some sort of traditional or cultural story about the loss of the berries. And the tribe has been, tribal folks have been living in this region of Alaska for over a thousand years, and they have no stories, no memory of a outbreak of this point, of this type ever occurring in the past. So here's another picture of Ephraim Moonen, and he's one of the tribal elders, and he's standing next to his salmon berries in his backyard. And you can see they were sprouting at the base, but the tops definitely died back as a result of defoliation. And then here's some pictures from higher elevation where alders and salmonberry were defoliated, and you can see going up the hillside, and, and in Anchorage you could see just entire bands on the mountainside would turn gray in around 2011, 2012, and they kind of defoliated most of the broadleaf plants. They didn't seem to touch Devil's Club or the Rusty Menzizi eye or, um, you know, a couple other species of plants, but they, they did a number on a lot of the broadleaf plants. And this is back to this picture here, and I don't know if you can see the, uh, the brown leaves here. 
where my mouse pointer is, and just kind of the thinness of the vegetation underneath here. And those are some of the defoliated blueberry plants. And like I said, it's not as impressive, but there were no blueberries to pick for a number of years in this area. But what we, we finally caught these guys red-handed, and this is a caterpillar. And uh, what we did was we captured a bunch of them, and we sent them to the Cooperative Extension Service, and we also sent them to the U.S. Forest Service to try to get them identified so we could figure out what these guys were. And what, what they came back and they said they were the autumn null moth and the Bruce Spanworm. And both of these guys are native to Alaska. Um, it's, it's real interesting that well, they've been documented in the Western science in Alaska for at least 50 years. And these two insects, are, they're known as geometrids, and they're a classic insect for uh, cyclical defoliators. They're, they're well studied in Europe and Canada, and uh, they're, they're, they're endemic to the whole northern hemisphere in the high latitudes. And they, they come back every seven to ten years, the outbreak, almost like clockwork. And uh, I, you know, I've been told by the entomologists that these guys are you know, in test, entomology textbooks as um, cyclical insects. So, you know, we saw this outbreak over the course of three years. We know the guys have been up here in Alaska for at least 50 years. And um, so something changed to allow the outbreak to occur. And we hypothesized that it was the climate change. And I put up some data. And in the last 50 years, the average annual temperature in Alaska has increased 3.4 degrees Fahrenheit. But if you look at just average winter temperatures for Alaska, they're up 6.3 degrees Fahrenheit in the last 50 years. So there's been a dramatic warming of winter temperatures in Alaska. And some of the predictions for the next 30 to 40 years, that, you know, that they, they say by, by the mid-century, this, this century, we should see another 3.5 to 7 degrees Fahrenheit temperature increases. So um, we're anticipating that we're going to see outbreaks from these critters again. And, uh, you know, we don't know for certain it's climate change that allowed them to outbreak, but it's definitely plausible and it's our leading hypothesis at this point. So once we identified these guys, we went out and did some education with the tribe. And I, I was able to go into the high school and the middle school and elementary school in Port Graham and work with the students. And we educated them on what the insect was, what the life cycle was. And this is a picture from April of 2012, I believe, and we went out looking for egg masses laid on um, some of the, the host plants to these insects. And we also worked, this picture was taken in May, and we worked with the adults in the community and we thought, well, you know, we can't do much about the um, berry resources out in the woods, but people's berries in their backyard, we, we can try to protect them from defoliation. So we did a training on the use of uh, BTK, which is an organic insecticide. It's selective and it only targets uh, caterpillars of moths and butterflies. So we, we went out that spring and we sprayed um, people's bushes who were willing to. The, the, the tribal folks are really weary of insecticides and uh, pesticides, so not everyone wanted to do this and only a few people did. But here's, this is a picture of the bushes I showed initially in the backyard. And this is Ephraim, the, the owner of that land, and he's spraying his bushes in his backyard. So we came back the next year to see what the results of our spraying were. And um, well, I forgot, this is a picture here of uh, one of the little caterpillars. They emerge from their eggs about the same time that the buds are breaking and feed on the leaves when they're, they're very young. But anyways, when we came back the next year, I had a hard time finding these guys. I, I took this picture the next, or not, it was, sorry, it wasn't the next year, but later on in the spring after we had sprayed. And I, I, I must have looked for three or four hours, and I found about three of these guys. And uh, at the same time, when we came back, the, uh, the plants looked great. They looked really good. And the thing I... We thought maybe it was a re result of the spraying, but when we started looking at all the bushes, they all looked good like this, and we couldn't find any of the bugs. So what had happened was the outbreak naturally broke, and the, the geometric populations collapsed by themselves. And, uh, you know, nature had just taken its course. So that, that year, they got a great berry harvest from the salmon berries. And so our spraying was, by the time we figured out what was going on and got back on the ground to try to do some insecticide controls, 
we were too late, the outbreak had already broken, which is great for everyone in the tribes. So the next thing I wanted to show you was, or at least tell you about how the village, the villages in this area get their energy. They're, they're off the road system, you can't drive a truck there, and they, they get heat from diesel fuel, and it comes in on barges. And they get one or two barge deliveries a year, and this is a picture of the barge out in the harbor in Port Graham bringing in the fuel for that year. And you know when the, the fuel price is, I think in Anchorage right now for gas, it's about $2.75 a gallon, and they're paying $5 a gallon in the villages right now. So energy costs here are pretty high, but they have a, a very large wood resource. So what the tribe is working on doing is installing a biomass boiler, and this particular one's a garden boiler, it burns cordwood, and they want to heat seven of the community villages, or community buildings in Port Graham. And so here's a picture of a couple of the buildings that they're going to heat. They're going to heat the tribal council office building in the community hall, the EMS and the firefighting public safety building, the uh, housing authority shop, the clinic in the village, as well as the, the museum for the village. And it's anticipated that this project will take roughly two acres of harvesting a year to supply the wood for the project. So um, what we wanted to do was, well, you know, if we're going to be harvesting two acres a year, maybe we can identify the land that would be, has the most potential as good blueberry habitat, where if we create an opening like this one here in this picture, um, we'll get a response on blueberries and we'll get more berry resources to predict and or to be able to harvest. And one of the tenets, I guess, of integrated pest management is that if you can have a healthier plant, that they'll resist insects and pests better than an unhealthy plant. So the idea is that, well, maybe we can get into the woods, harvest some wood for the village's energy needs, and at the same time increase the, the productivity and the quality of the berry plants in the area and, and make them more able, better able to resist a future defoliation or at least more resilient so they can recover more quickly after an outbreak ends. And so here's a few pictures of areas that could be good berry habitat. This is an area of blowdown, and we can pull that wood out and use it for firewood and at the same time produce berry habitat. So what we did was we wrote a grant to the uh, NPLCC, and it was funded by them jointly with the uh, Alaska Alaska Science Center. And we wrote a proposal to try to predict, using modeling techniques, where good berry habitat would be so that we could get in there and do our wood harvesting in those specific areas that have the most potential to increase blueberry habitat in particular. So we worked with Dr. Robin Reich with Colorado State University, and he did the modeling for us. And this is a uh, different Landsat band that he used. Um, he used Landsat imagery along with topography, vegetation typing, and you know as much data as we could provide him, and he produced an, a couple models for us. And the first one he produced, I have a picture of here, and it's, it's been fuzzied so that you can't really see what it is, but you can see there's different greens, reds, and blues that represent the different um, potential for blueberry habitat. So we created this initial model, and then we went out and showed this to the tribal elders and to the youth, to ground truth it, we also put in a number of plots to take on the ground data to refine that model. And so here's a picture of um, me, and I went out there with uh, Robin Reich and his, his assistant from Colorado State, and we, we brought this to the youth, and we brought it to the elders in the community, and we said, here's what we did, here's this map, this model map we have that's predicting where the berry habitat is, Let's go see if there's actually berries here. And we did this in August, and we brought, brought everyone out in the woods, and, and the elders kind of said, no, this area we wouldn't find berries in, or yes, we would, and we, we went and picked berries to see what we could find. <coughs> and we took that information to refine our models. And here's some examples of, of different model products that we got from this work. This is uh, basal area per acre, which is a measure of forest density, which is important to... Uh, berry habitat, uh, total tree height of the forest. 
here's another model that shows canopy closure. The, the canopy closure model was extremely important for predicting berry habitat. And this one here is a, the base to life height on the, the crown of the tree. So if you were to go out in the forest, how, how high off the ground are the lowest live branches? And we were able to use all those model products to, to put, put them together and come up with a, um, a better berry model, you know, predicting both berry abundance and berry, um, you know, how good the harvest of the berry was. So the abundance of the berry plants and then the productivity of those berry plants as far as harvest. And, and there's a few key metrics that we found really influenced those. Uh, one of them was aspect, certain aspects better for berry plants. And generally it was on slopes and not in the flat areas where we, not, not necessarily steep slopes, but just on slopes of um, moderate, kind of southwest facing slopes where we found the most berry plants. Um, we also found that there were more berry plants in uh, sites of high productivity, but that the sites with low forest productivity were more productive for the berry plants. So what I think what was going on there is that the high, highly productive soils have a denser canopy and larger trees, and the berry plants don't get as many resources. But when you get onto the lower productivity forests, there's more light getting down to the canopy and the forest floor and the competing trees aren't as big and the berries are producing, the berry plants are producing more berries. So um, what I've got here, this is actually a picture of Robin and his assistant and one of the locals from the village who helped us out collecting the field plots. And it's also a picture of the uh, Port Graham Airport. So if you ever fly into Port Graham, we don't have uh, TSA or anything here. This is, this is the airport. I've got my contact information here um, if anybody wants to call me or send me an email. But I have a few conclusions before I wrap the talk up. And sorry, this one's not quite as interesting. It's black and white in text. But I, I just wanted to remind you that for the tribal people in the Chugach region, subsistence resources are very important, and especially the blueberries. You know, like I mentioned before, the salmon berry are probably, or not the salmon berries, but the the salmon, the fish, are probably the most important resource, but berries are also very important. So the tribe has a very good, you know, traditional record of, you know, through stories and oral history of kind of what has happened in the area. And when, when we look at the, the tribe's history and memory, and we look at Western science, we don't have any record of geometric moss defoliating berry plants significantly in this area. And we believe that climate change may be responsible for allowing these moths to have the big outbreak that they had. And um, to be ready for that in the future, we want to try to improve our berry habitat. So we use um, these modeling products that we got from Dr. Reich in Colorado State University to identify certain areas on the ground that might benefit the most from uh, removing the above ground forest canopy, so creating small gaps and uh, strips or small patch cuts that allow partial shade for the blueberries to grow in there and, and thrive. And what we hope to do is have a more healthy berry plant so that they aren't as affected as, as badly by a future um, geometric moth outbreak, which we expect will happen in the next five to seven years. So I also want to mention that uh, this project was funded by the North Pacific Landscape Conservation Cooperative and also the Alaska Science Center. And I had a lot of help from Dr. Robin Reich and from Dr. John Lundquist with the U.S. Forest Service State and Private Forestry here in Alaska to, to do a lot of this work. Okay, well, thank you again, everyone, for being here. If you have any questions for Nathan, his contact information is still on the screen there. If you're interested in learning more about the MPLCC, you can visit us at mplcc.org. So thanks again, everyone, for being here, and have a great day.